So, okay, I will be fine, I guess. Uh, thanks a lot for being here. Uh, I know it's been a while, but that's why we are still here. Actually, I like to see you still eating. So, first thing, we have Boyan. Yay! A warm applause, please. Um, um, we also have uh, a giveaway today, uh, JetBrains license, which will be given away by the end of this talk. And uh, of course, at this point, I have to thank Richt Loxia for the nice location and uh, all these things that they have done for us. So, Ariane, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. <laughs> well, welcome everybody to RIGD Loxia. Um, it's a Dutch abbreviation, as most of what we do here is in Dutch. Um, a short introduction of where you are. Um, it's an uh, alliance of uh, three companies, two engineering agencies called Arcadis and Movaris, and uh, ProRail, the Dutch Rail Infra company. Um, the company in total is about uh, 130, 135 people, um, and the development department of the company is, uh, um, I think, now 85 people. Um, that includes developers, uh, product owners, scrum masters, testers, uh, team management. I'm one of the two team managers in the development department. Um, I had a small YouTube video about what we do, but I think it's in Dutch, so not very appropriate to some of you. Um, so in short, the products that we uh, deliver, uh, engineering tooling to design, real infra and especially then safety and uh, it, like electrical lines, um, the tracks themselves, um, many things I don't know the English words for. Um, configuration for systems that determine the routes of the trains. Uh, we have the, the uh, images, drawings, uh, data on the current uh, infrastructure but also up to 84 weeks ahead, we know what the uh, track will look like. And um, we provide this uh, uh, infra data to departments within Royal and also NS, um, so they can determine uh, basically the time schedule uh, for two years ahead. Uh, other things we do, we yeah, have tools and infra data for the uh, engineering agencies themselves. Um, configuration and change management on the uh, on data we provide to ProRail, uh, advice on new products and services, and uh, quite a bit of innovation. And how our development department works is uh, we have uh, eight uh, <coughs> Scrum teams uh, with uh, sprints of two weeks. We do a lot of pair programming, test driven development if possible. Uh, and our people get half day of innovation time per sprint. As long as you can explain uh, in a cred credible sense uh, what you are doing is valuable to ProRail or the department. Um, yeah, you can basically try out a lot of uh, uh, new technologies. The main stack we use is Java 8 currently, 9 is on the radar. Um, Angular for the web applications, we're migrating away from some older uh, uh, frameworks. Uh, Eclipse RCP for the desktop applications, we have a few of those as well. Uh, Mongo for some, I think for the web uh, applications, mostly Mongo, and for the older uh, it's uh, Oracle. We run uh, applications, not all, but some on Azure, and we've taken baby steps in the area of Docker, uh, although I think we're looking at Kubernetes as well, de determining what suits best for uh, our needs. Um, and yeah, maybe in Jenkins, Sonacube, uh, I guess half of the world is using that. <laughs> so that's basically uh, where you are. Um, we also, we have a lot of people working here, but also uh, looking for people, Dutch speaking at the moment, that's uh, yeah, a big drawback. Our dom domain is, is all in Dutch. Um, and that's difficult enough as it is. So, uh, uh, yeah, and speaking non-native uh, uh, Dutch is uh, an extra yeah, difficulty for most people. So we hire uh, Dutch-speaking people only at this point in time. 
um, medium senior positions for uh, Java development, uh, a, a tech lead as well. Uh, we do a bit of Mendix. Uh, we're looking for a junior in that area. And uh, yeah, application support can, uh, can use a pair of extra hands as well. So if you know anybody, point them to us. We do a lot of cool stuff. And that's my introduction. I want as much time as possible. Thank Boy, you. Um, Cool. Yeah, so we're talking Java and GraphQL and keeping things dynamic, but first things first, a uh, quick crash course on GraphQL in case you're not up to speed. If you are, bear with it, it's short. So we'll start with a what. So GraphQL is a data description in query language. What it means is uh, it gives you a way to formally describe data, so everything that's coming in and out of your services has a description, it has a type, and it's also a way to query stuff also mutate stuff, but that's just a special kind of query. Uh, it provides a type system, so similar to maybe some other technologies, uh, it has a type system, which means that all data coming in and out is typed, it has a formal structure that's known ahead of time. Uh, so you can think of Whistle and Soap in this respect, how it had a Whistle schema, and how it described every all, uh, all data types ahead of time. But don't think of it too much, because you know nobody deserves that. Uh, <laughs> it's an uh, open source specification. It's a really open source as of a couple of days ago. Facebook finally relicensed it. So it's really open source. So you can do whatever you want with it. Um, it has implementations in all kinds of languages. I just put some of them there. Uh, JavaScript being the reference implementation. Most of the innovation, most of the stuff is happening in the JavaScript world and then it sort of trickles down to everything else. But uh, we're, we're fortunate enough to have most of the features in all the languages anyway. Uh, it is also a server-side runtime for executing queries. So what this means is that you have a single runtime on your server that accepts all the queries. You'll see how this uh, drastically uh, influences the architecture as a result. So this is basically the piece that you get out of the box. This is the, the something that the engine provides itself, the implementation provides itself. Uh, despite popular belief, it's absolutely unrelated to graph databases and the queries for, you know, query languages for uh, uh, <coughs> querying those, those databases. So, for example, usually what people think of is Neo4j or graph databases like that, and they're a language called Cypher. There's a Gremlin also, which is a Apache-sponsored project. Uh, GraphQL is unrelated to those. You can still use a graph, a graph database underneath if you want, but it's unrelated to GraphQL. So... Uh, it is absolutely uh, independent of the storage or the language. You can use GraphQL for any language. Doesn't care what your storage is. It could be one of the uh, graph databases mentioned above. It might even map well, but it's not necessary. You could have, uh, in this aspect, it's the most similar thing to REST. So think of REST. What we're trying to replace or make better with GraphQL is REST. So we're not changing your storage or your whatever. We're changing the way you talk between the client and the server. That's what we want to improve with it. So why would you want something like this? There's three main reasons. There's three promises that it gives you. First being, it gives you a concise way of describing your data. So think how, for example, right now, if you have a RESTful API, you usually have some RAML files or some Swagger files or some JSON schemas or God knows what to describe all your data. And this is all maintained then by you and their tools don't really agree on how to use these things. So this is something that GraphQL is trying to solve. So this is how it does it. So here, I think we use this stupid thing as a pointer at least. So, <laughs> yay. Uh, <laughs> so, okay. something, yeah. Um, so uh, this is how it looks like. So for example, here, this would be a root query. So let's say you you want to query for a hero of uh, of a certain episode. This is of course Star, Star Wars themed because all GraphQL examples have to be Star Wars themed for some reason. So you give it the episode number, you say, for example, who's the hero of episode one, and it returns a character. So a typed thing. It didn't just return, you know, a blob of JSON, but a typed thing, it returned a character. Whereas character is further defined as a type that has a name, uh, friends, and a home world, where name is a string, friend is a list of characters. So you see how it's interestingly recursive here. So a character has friends that are also characters, and then home world is a planet. And then finally, we have the type planet, which has a name and type. 
So this would be one uh, uh, entire hierarchy, for example. So we begin with a with root type of everything. There's two roots, one for queries, one for mutations. So we begin with a root. We have a top level query here that returns a character. We have a character. And then finally, we have the planet referred to by the character. So this is the way you describe data in GraphQL. So you see, it's pretty much sort of JSON-y looking kind of syntax, but with types. Uh, the second big advantage of why do you want this in your application is that it promises you no under or over fetching. What we mean by this is that normally with a REST API, what happens is you, you fire a request, you get back whatever the server feels you should get back. <coughs> you don't control it. So you cannot say, give me you know, all the characters, but I want only the names of the, not everything, for example, or you know, don't fetch their friends or something like that. You don't really control this, at least not in a standard way. Uh, same thing for, uh, so this is a problem in two directions. You might be getting too much or you might be getting too little and need to do multiple trips to get everything you want. With GraphQL, you don't do that. You always get exactly what you want in one go. So you can request deeply nested structures like this. You can say, give me the hero of episode four. I want the name of the hero, I want the home world, and I want the name and the type of the home world. So you re request a deeply nested structure in one go. And you notice here, for example, I'm not requesting friends because I don't need them in this request. So I'm only getting these. So I won't get, I won't overfetch. And I will get homeworld, for example, in the same, same go. So I won't underfetch either. And the third thing, uh, it guarantees predictable results uh, in the sense that the results will always be identical in structure to the request itself. So you see how you requested a hero. You got a hero. Inside there's a name, there's a name. There's a home world, home world. So it will always uh, cr uh, map one to one between the, re uh, the request and the result. It guarantees even the ordering of fields. So if you requested name first and then type second, you'll get name first, type second. So the re results are always 100% predictable. You always know what you're expecting. So your client can be much smarter in that. So let's do a very short uh, case study of how like a very <coughs> typical page might look like when done with GraphQL and done with done with REST. So this is a super simple shopping cart. So you have a shopping cart, the green thing, the whole thing is a shopping cart. Inside of it, you have the three items that you purchased. So the, the red things are the, the items you bought. They all have, you, you'll notice they have price, they have a, you know, a name, some kind of description. Uh, each has a picture, so we have uh, three products that we purchased in this cart. So let's say you want to do it in a very normative, you know, standard uh, REST way. So how you do it? You first request the shopping cart by ID, for example, being your current uh, session ID or something, user ID, or whatever. So you request the shopping cart. Shopping carts usually would then contain a list of products by ID. Then you would go back and request the descriptions and the prices for each of those products by ID. So one, two, three. When you receive those, then you'll make the request for their images, for example, to render these. So again, color-coded, green to green, red to red, you know, blue to blue. So you would do in total of seven requests to render this thing here, this shopping cart. Of course, you don't have to do it this way. There's multiple ways you can mitigate this issue with REST. So common thing, you could say something like this. You could say cart, but, you know, expanded, well, product expanded. So you can maybe you know do something like this. You can say, I want the shopping cart with all the products inside expanded into the full structure. Or you could go more granular because expanded product still means get me everything. You may not want to get everything. You maybe only want certain things. So let's say I want only name, description, and price. So you can do something like this. But you know, then different page might have different uh, requirements here. So you kind of always end up with something like this. You can do a custom endpoint with cards with all the stuff I need for this page. This is eventually what you end up with if you do anything even remotely interesting. But then, of course, you need to change it for that specific mobile application or something, and then you have the version 2 of all the things I need. And then, you know, descriptions are long and the mobile is small real estate, so you don't want to render the whole description, so you get all the stuff I need but without the descriptions. And then it goes on like that. But this is only on the, so, and the client needs to know of all these changes. So of course, if you evolve anything, then you're, you know, your one client might be using this and the other might be using this and then you can't really do anything about it. You're set in stone for a while there. 
And then, of course, there's implications to the server itself. Every time you do anything, so you create a new endpoint, or you maybe give it new capabilities like this, so you need to update your endpoint to, well, serve new data now. You need to update your models as well, because you probably back all the things you do with, uh, you know, Java types, and mo uh, you have a proper model. Which means if you add a new field, and then you suddenly need to uh, add a new field to the, all the things you need, you update the endpoint to include a new field, you update the model to include a new field, some of these problems are resolvable, uh, resolvable through ATLs, so discoverability might become less of an issue and then you maybe can get, a, get rid of some of these things. But it really, really doesn't help with uh, the fact that you need to do multiple requests. It actually makes it worse. It aggravates this. And overfetching becomes an even worse problem, so it's kind of opposite to what we started with. Or you can just, you know, not do any of that and just do this instead. <laughs> You can just say, I'd like a cart, and with, I'd like the total thing inside, and I'd like the products inside with name, price, and quantity. If you, this is a mobile application, it didn't request a description, for example, because it doesn't need to render it, so no overfetching. If, you, if the client ever changes the requirements, so the mobile application now does want, eh, you just add a field here and you're done. Which means the client is completely in charge of what gets fetched. If the client's requirement changes, you don't touch the server, no model changes, no endpoint changes, no nothing. The client just can do the new thing because they are in charge now. So for a query that looks like this, you would get a response like this. So as we said, they map always one-to-one. -one. So we have a cart, we have a cart here. Total, total, and so on and so forth. Products being a list returned multiple. So we got one product, second product, and all of them have exactly what you said, name, price, quantity, same things. So that's it. You basically kind of, if you look, if you squint just right and look at this query, it's kind of like JSON without the values. Mm -hmm. And the response is the same JSON but with values. So very predictable. But even maybe even more interesting than this is the, the, the impact this has on your architecture. It basically completely changes your architecture. For the much better, I would argue, of course. But here's how it works. So you have a REST. REST architecture, and commonly it will look like this. You have your client, the browser, usually, not necessarily, bunch of endpoints, so these would be your endpoints, and then arbitrary storages. So each of the endpoints talks to one or more or zero, doesn't matter, but arbit an arbitrary number of storages, maybe to a different REST endpoint to talk to a third-party service, or it's maybe talking to you know SQL database or uh, something else. And the assembly of the response is usually here, in the endpoint itself. So endpoint is usually this like fat thing that contains logic. So maybe it went to, you know, this endpoint went to SQL to fetch something, and it went to Mongo to fetch something else, and then merged the two in the response, and then sent a response back to the client. So this is how it would normally work. So this might, you know, just talk to Mongo, this talks to everything, and so on. So you have different things. With GraphQL, it changes drastically, that everything becomes linear. Uh, because there's only one endpoint now. That's the GraphQL runtime. The, there's only one endpoint that's uh, exposed. So all the client requests always talk to the single endpoint inside, internally. Every little field, everything that you requested is delegated to a single resolver function that is in charge of resolving the value for that specific field, so one value at a time. So in our previous example, for example, if you ask for the name of the product, there's a function that resolves just the name of the product, nothing else. And that function will typically either talk to nothing at all because everything is in memory, you just need to get something, or to a single endpoint. There's never need to talk to multiple things to get a single value, right? So your normal resolvers will be super simple, small things that just fetch a single thing and only if that field is actually requested. If the client never requests it, you never talk to SQL that stores the field because you don't need it. Same thing, so the thing, for example, here, it had to talk to everything to assemble the request, regardless of what the client needs because the client doesn't choose what they get back with REST. Here, the client says, oh, I'd like only the thing from S3, for example, so you don't need to talk to everything else. And then in turn, when all the field values are resolved, GraphQL runtime will for you assemble it back uh, in the same structure like the query was and then return it to the client. So this is not your problem. You don't assemble the responses. So let's see, that was all, oh yeah, I'll just draw your attention to one thing. 
logo will always correspond to the topic that I'm touching. So if it's globally GraphQL specific, like, well, if it talks about GraphQL regardless of technology or whatever, then it has a GraphQL logo. From here, it's Java GraphQL. So uh, how do we do this in Java? So this was GraphQL 101. So now let's go into the crunchy details. So the f your, your main responsibility when you're developing a GraphQL-enabled application is to define the schema. Schema in this context contains not only the definitions of all the types and all the fields and whatever, but also the logic for resolving. So it contains the resolver functions as well. So schema is an executable thing. Well, contextually, but it's a, in general, it's, it contains the resolvers as well. So there's two ways to do it. First way being the code. So you can just compose the schema using Java code. So this would be a canonical example. So let's, ha let's say we have a address, a type called address. It has some fields, so one field being the street name of type string, another field being house number of type int. String and int being built-in GraphQL types, so I don't need to define them. So this would be a very simple object type. So it's an object type, it says object, you know, you start, you, it's a builder pattern, you create it. Then you, for example, have a further specification. So you have a person type. We have a type person, again, an object type. And one of the fields is the addresses field, which is a list, a GraphQL list of addresses, this being addresses. So we have a list of the previously defined object. And immediately, we here define the data fetcher, aka the resolver function. So how do we fetch the addresses for a person? For example, we do <coughs> some database query, something to get their address. Just the address, just that one field. Then we have a field called name of type string, so you, uh, a person has a name. Here, I don't specify the data fetcher, just like I didn't specify any data fetchers here. The reason being that if you don't specify any data fetcher, there's a built-in one, which will just take the current object, uh, uh, in this case being the person object, and just sort of uh, call a getter on it. So if you don't specify anything else, it means it's already in the context, it's already in memory, you just call a getter. So if you have a person object to get a name from it, you just call the get name and you get it. So you, I didn't need to specify that here. That's why, but this one, for example, because it talks to a database, it has some more logic in it, it's not just a simple getter, that's why you need to give it the function as well. So now you assembled an object called person, referring to this other object that we previously defined. So going further, let's make some use of this. We have the type, but still no way to do anything with it. Um, so you have to define the root type. So basically, the, if you think of the entire thing as a graph, which you should, because it's a graph, um, the root of the graph, the entry node, is this um, root query thing. So there's, as I said, there's two roots, one for all the queries, the other for all the uh, mutations. So all the queries and all the mutations are the fields of, of these root types, and then they branch further. So here, we have a query called people by name. So we're, we're making a new query called people by name, which accepts an argument called name of type string. So people by name ac uh, takes name, as, the, as it implies, of string type. It returns a GraphQL list of people, of person. So the argument is name, the result is a list of person type. We saw person defined previously. And the way we resolve this query, we call, usually, typically you would call some, you know, uh, service, uh, any business logic in your application. So here, let's say we have a person service, we call the find by name, and then you finally resolve it. So this would be the way you define this in code. This is a very simple schema. It has one query, people by name, takes string, returns person, person defined previously, has an address, address, again, a custom type, and then that's it. That, that's the entire, the entire graph here. Typically now, you would of course have some Java code to back this up because you're working in Java, so you expect to have something like this. So as we said previously, you have a person type, person has a name and a list of addresses, just like we said, and then some getters and setters. Address, very simple Pojo, just has a house number and street name, like we said, nothing special. And then finally, the person service that has the logic. So for finding people by name, this is our query, how we resolve our query. 
So if you then you know connect these, the class person corresponds to this type here. So we said it returns a list of people, and then so this function then here corresponds. Well, this is actually the data fetcher. This is how we resolve the value by calling this function. So this function returning list of person, this GraphQL type being list of person. So it corresponds one to one. This is one way to work with GraphQL Java. It's not the only way. So there's an alternative when you start from schema. So you don't start with a code like we did here. Instead, you start by writing the schema. So let's see how that works. So uh, SDL stands for schema definition language. Sometimes it's also called IDL for, I guess, interface definition language or something. This, this is the, what you've seen already. So you know this from the first slide. So uh, we have a schema, that's our root thing. We have query being the entry point into the schema. The, uh, the only two, two fields that you can, well, three fields that you can have here are query, mutation, and subscription. We'll touch them a little bit later, but logic is the same. Whatever you learn here applies. So uh, we have a query, that's the root type. Uh, and then on the root type, we have a field called people by name. That's our root query that we expose. So we have people by name, takes a string, returns a list of piece, person. So the, the square brackets mean a list. So take a string, return a list of person. Here's the person definition, here's the address definition. So you can start by writing this. Instead of doing the code thing that we did, you can just write this instead. And then the way you turn this into an executable thing is by doing something like this. So this is kind of simplified, but it does everything that it should. So you load the schema file. This being, you know, this whole thing is just, you know, a normal file. You call, you parse the, you parse the file. At that moment, what you got is a type registry. So it means it will know about all these types: the query, the person, and the address. Um, and then what's missing in this schema is the the logic. So there's no way to resolve this. We now define the people by name query, but we don't define how to resolve it. There's no way to describe the you know business logic inside of this schema language. So what we're doing here is we're attaching the resolvers to existing types. So this is what the code here, this entire block here, it just attaches the resolution logic to the schema. So this is how we do that. We say for query type, define a data fetcher called for people by name. So we're hooking it up to this one. So we're saying people by name, this is how we work. We take the name from the arguments and then we called our person service find by name Java class that we saw previously. This is how we attach logic to this. So now we're no longer assembling it with code. We parse the existing schema, which is just a string. We parse it and we attach the logic where it's necessary. So we need logic for resolving this. Here's the logic for resol resolving this. We attach a data fetcher to people by name. When you're done with that, you just generate executable schema. So the schema here is called non-executable schema because it doesn't have execution logic. It doesn't know how to resolve its values. This is just sort of a declared schema, but it doesn't do anything. This is the way you turn it into an executable schema that you can fire queries against. Once you do this, you're done. You have the schema, you can fire queries against the schema, that's it. So these are the two major ways how you approach things. And they're kind of different, as you saw. One is sort of you write code and then schema gets generated. The other one, you have the schema and then you attach code somehow in a different way. So different tooling will help you with different things. So there's a, in Java ecosystem, it's not that rich like for JavaScript, but still you have some tooling to help you with these two approaches. But you usually have to choose an approach up front. You can't, you know. So there's tools that will help you do this in a more concise way. There's tools that will do the, the other thing in a more concise way, so you choose. But, oh yeah, so just uh, 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 drawing your attention again. So query type, we were mentioning it here. This is its field that we're attaching this to, so that's it. So, um, but there's one problem in both of these cases. So it doesn't matter how you approach it from code or from a schema, there's an issue here. You're duplicating every single type definition. You have the type person, you already set in your Java code that there's a class called person. So that class has types, the, uh, has fields, name, and address, and an address is a list of objects called address, and that name is a string, so on. So you duplicate this every single time, and every time you touch, you change this in your 
model, you have to change your schema again. So you have to dis do it manually, sort of. Another problem is you have this another layer to maintain. So as I said, the one change immediately changes the other one. So you're duplicating, you're making you know problems for yourself, and that's the. So we don't want to do that. <coughs> so let's see what we can do about that. So one interesting approach is dynamically generating the schema. What's this approach trying to do is capitalize on this fact that Java is a typed language. JavaScript isn't, so JavaScript doesn't have this problem. But Java is a typed language. We already have the types. We already have everything. We know the structure already. So how about we just you know, generate a schema based on that? Let's capitalize on this knowledge that we have. We know the static types ahead of time. So instead of duplicating and pretending we're living in nodes, let's you know, do it a nice way. So this will eliminate type duplication. You have your model done, keep it dry, or whatever is the lingo these days. Um, allows you to follow best practices because it means you can still structure your code in a nice way. It means you can still have your stateless service classes, for example, and your clean pojos, you know, and everything. You don't need to wire these strange objects now just to satisfy the needs of the of GraphQL. Uh, but in order for this to be huh, the solution as it claims to be, it needs to be adaptable and customizable. If it wants you to do strange rituals to you know, uh, satisfy it, then it's still not a solution. So let's see how we can approach that. So now I'm going to introduce the amazing library called Speaker, written by yours truly, obviously. <laughs> so this is what Speaker does for you. So let's say you have a person service. We saw it already. It has a function, find by name, takes a string, returns a list of people, for example, by, you know, querying a database or something. So you have this. This is something you already have in your application, not something you're specifically writing for GraphQL, right? You have this somewhere. Well, something like it. Then you can sort of just do this. You can just say, I'd like to expose this as a GraphQL query under this name. So you just sort of declare that you want to expose it. You have, an, you have your person type as well. So your normal POJO, nothing in it, no weird stuff, no logic in the POJO, no nothing. It just has the first name, last name for the person. This is, so again, you can do this to sort of, you know, change the name, for example. In this specific case, it doesn't do anything. It's not necessary at all. But if you wanted to change the name, for example, you would do it like this. Because if you think of it, the name is also just a query. It's just a nested query, but still a query. So this would be a way to sort of uh, say how you want this exposed. So that's your standard stuff. So this is not GraphQL specific still. This is just your POJO and your service class. And OK, you have your, the instance of your service, obviously. If it's stateless and everything and you know does the nice architecture, then it's probably stateless and it's just a singleton, but not necessarily. But let's presume for now it is. You would create a schema generator. You would register the service that you like you would like exposed, and you say it's a singleton because in this case it is. So you register the service you like exposed, and you generate a schema, and that's it. You're done. So the whole thing that you saw in the previous four or five slides, whatever, doing the whole schema thing or assembling it with code or whatever, you just don't. Is this uh, with a something like the, build the builder pattern? Yeah, it it tries to be that. Yeah. Yeah, it seems to be. Yeah. So. I originally called it schema builder, but then I kind of decided that I'll call some other types of classes builder, so I needed to rename this to generator, but it's still a builder. Yeah. <laughs> Either case, just naming, it's still a builder pattern, yeah. Cool. Um, so how you then do something with this schema? This is now no longer related to speaker or anything. This is how you generally do it with GraphQL Java. So what happens is you have the schema, you create this GraphQL object, which is your runtime, then you have some query that you got from client or something. It's just a string with a query, people by name. For, so we're looking for all the all people named John, and then we want their first and last name. Well, first name is going to be John, so both. But you know, it's a simple query, and you execute this query. So you have your runtime object which you created here, and you just execute a query. That's it. You get your result. That's it. So this is this part here is how you always do it with GraphQL Java. So the interesting part was how you acquire the schema. So you saw now three ways of doing it. You saw the way where you assemble the schema using Java code. 
the way where you used to parse the schema definition language and then attach resolution, and the third way was generating it. So the only difference is was how you acquired the schema instance. From then on, it's the same thing. You create a runtime from that schema, you fire a query against it, you're done. So let's see some uh, how you query, how you make this thing useful. Oh yeah, no. Yeah. So when this logo, it it means it's speaker specific. All right. So here's our person service again. So we want to see something more interesting. Now what you saw is a very simplistic query that you know got something and returned something back. There was no nesting. There was nothing interesting going on. So let's see some more scenarios that are slightly more complicated and more interesting to talk about. So let's say you have a <coughs> query like this. You have a query that takes a person. So person is now input. And based on the person, it loads their Twitter profile. It could also just be, you know, person ID or something. But for the sake of the argument, let's say it takes a whole person object. <coughs> and it returns their Twitter profile, where Twitter profile is another object that has, for example, number of followers, your uh, handle, and things like that. I don't know, your la latest tweets or something. And you would resolve this by talking to the Twitter API to get a profile for a person. So quite simple. And we have our previous thing. So our old old buddy here, uh, find by name. So find by name talks to a SQL database to find people, and then it talks to Twitter API to get their Twitter profiles. These now these are both top level queries. Both this query and this query are now on the top level. Something you can ask for. So this is how, for example, you would fire a query for, for this. You would say, so this is input. So this entire object is the input value. So we have input called person. This is the parameter called person with their first name, last name. So we create the entire object. We want their Twitter handle, and we want the number of tweets back. So this, this way, we're triggering this, uh, this query here. Then we have the query that you already saw on the previous slide. People by name, it takes it takes the name, and it wants these back. But let's say you wanted people by name, so you want all the Johns, and you want all the Twitter profiles of every resulting person. So you want the Twitter profiles of all the Johns. How would you do this? With the way it's assembled right now, you would have to do a round trip. You would first ask for all the Johns, and then for every result, you would call Twitter profile, meaning multiple round trips. And what was the first promise GraphQL gave, gave us? No round trips, so that's a lie here. So how we solve that? So we don't want it like this. What we do want is to be able to do this, right? That's the promise. That I'm able to fetch a deeply nested structure in one go. But as you remember, our person object only had first name and last name fields. It never has this field because our pojo for a person does not contain this field, and it should not contain this field because, you know, talking to the Twitter API is not the job of a pojo. We want best practices kept. We want, you know, logic where logic is and data where data is. At least, you know, in, uh, in uh, Java world, we believe that some other people might disagree. But um, so we want this, but we want to keep our Java intact. We do not want to now go back to the person pojo and add logic for this field. We don't want to do that. Turns out it's super easy to fix this. All you do, you add this annotation. That popped up. So that wasn't here, now it's here. So you just this context thing. So what we're saying now, that the context of this query is person. So it means that anything returning person can, I mean, that uh, anything returning person can have this as a subquery like this. So we have a query here returning a list of people and then this as a subquery. So this is the way you connect them. So you didn't touch your Java code, your Java code remains clean like it was. You didn't add any strange things to satisfy GraphQL, you know, everything like it should be, but it's still a graph. So this is the way, this is the magic annotation that turns disparate things that merges them into a graph. This is how you create a graph of the things. How many, how many, uh Levels can you go up to? <coughs> infinite. So if this was another object, you could go deep. So it's infinite. You can do whatever. You can even recurse and okay. do anything. As long as the 
the only thing that you must not do is have like an infinitely recursive structure. But it can recurse, it can do anything. So, so that was the talk. Now let's do a more interesting part. Let's do a demo. But after the demo, there'll be so this this part of the talk up to now was about how you do GraphQL and what's GraphQL and how you do it in Java. It was sort of you know vague top level kind of overview thing. Uh, just for you to you know know what's up. Uh, then we do. I'll do a demo to show you how this is applied to a simple Spring Boot application, the simplest application ever. Just how to use this. And then afterwards, for those of you who already know GraphQL, maybe a more interesting part, where um, I'm going to talk about common about common problems that you might encounter with this, because I kind of hand waved a bunch of stuff right now, and I'll show you a bit more about that. So stick around. <laughs> so I'll have to figure out how to show my ID now. Okay. I guess I will do something like this. Mm -hmm. Where data speed here? Yes. Okay. So there's that. Uh, is it big enough, or do I need to zoom? I need to zoom. I definitely need to zoom. Oh. Oh. I definitely. <laughs> Oh, you are right indeed. We have a lot of presenters here. <laughs> Toggle presentation mode. Let's see if that does anything. Oh, well, that did something. Okay. I am happy. All right. So, simplest ever, Spring Boot, nothing special. We have a, you know, a controller. It says it's a REST controller, which it kind of is. And all it does... So, you know, very, very simplistic controller. You will not be surprised by many things here. So let's say we have a couple of these objects, which are the service objects here called query for explicitness, but they're just normal service classes uh, with, with logic for. So for example, the person query will have the, you know, load person, save person, that kind of thing. Or more interesting, like fetch Twitter profile, whatever we just showed. Same thing, social network query will be able to, you know, fetch Twitter, uh, and so on. So vendor will fetch vendors, I don't know, just some samples. So we have these. They're, uh, because it's a Spring application, these are singletons and they get auto-wired, so we just inject all these things. What we, so what we want to do is expose the logic from them through GraphQL. So what we've done here, as, as I uh, uh, showed you previously, we create a schema generator. We register Look, yeah, okay, ignore this part for a second. So you register all the beans you want exposed. So you want the person query, blah, 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 domain, uh, product, and so on. So we register all the beans that we would like to expose. Uh, this here customizes the way that, um, how we choose what methods on the, on the beans we want exposed. So the pre in the previous examples, what I showed you is that you put an annotation. But let's say it's a third party object, you cannot open it in an annotation, for example. So to, to solve that problem, you can customize what methods get exposed. By default, uh, only the annotated, uh, uh, on the, at least on the top level, only annotated methods will be exposed. So this is that. Annotated resolver builder means it will expose as a resolver only annotated methods. But we wanted to customize in this example, public resolver builder says, take any public method and expose it. There's some, some other built-in ones. You can, only, you can also say expose only things that ap appear like the, the Java bean getters and setters. So setters becoming mutations and getters becoming uh, queries and everything else you ignore, for example, or expose everything public or annotated and so on. So here I'm registering two things. So I want everything that's annotated to respect the annotation and be customized, you know, by the annotation name and everything. If it doesn't have an annotation, but is public, I still want it exposed. What this base package thing does is, if you think there's a slight catch to the sentence, expose everything that's public. And that is, if you have a hierarchy, your class extends something, and at least it extends objects. There's public methods and objects as well, and you don't want those exposed. You don't want hash code exposed. You don't want things like that. 
So you limit the scope of this by giving the base package. So say, don't get out of this package, basically. So go up the hierarchy and find all the methods that are still within the package. So if you pop out and you're now in Java lang object, then you, it no longer satisfies and you stop exposing it. <coughs> so the, uh, and here, of course, I put my own root package of the, of the example. So this, so this is the entire thing. Then you can generate the schema. So we are, to recap, we're exposing the methods from these service objects all the public methods and the annotated methods. If there's an annotation, it takes precedence. Otherwise, we call the query the same way that the method is called. So whatever the method name becomes the query name. That's what this one does. But you can al always customize it to your needs. If you, have some, if you need to expose some third party something, you can't add annotations, you don't want every public method, there's no you know, obvious logic to it, you just write your own uh, resolver builder. It's quite simple, you just look at the existing ones, build the same thing and say, oh, I would only like the first, the second, and the fifth method exposed, and uh, that's it. I don't want the other ones, for example. So you get to choose what you expose. The, the default logic is, I'd say, smart, because top level will be an annotated stuff, and lower stuff will be uh, all the, the, the all, all bean uh, properties. So for example, for your pojos, you don't need to do anything. All the getters and setters will be exposed because that's the default behavior. All right, so once we, so we, if you notice, this is in the constructor. So we're doing this once. We're constructing the schema once. We generate a new GraphQL runtime. Not exactly correctly named here, but okay. So we, gen, uh, we create a run runtime based on the schema. And this object is what we want to keep for the lifetime of the application, at least usually. Not, there are cases when you don't want that, but normally this is what you, uh, you hold on to. You hold on to this uh, runtime thingy. And then the this is maybe a, a cool thing to, to point out. There's only a single endpoint ever. So here, the endpoint is RefQL. What we do here, uh, we take JSON, we take requests as JSON, it gets turned into a map string object automatically by Spring. Uh, and then we just execute. So what happens is from the request, we can get the query. Here also the operation name, I'll ignore that for now. It's very edge casey. I'll explain it when time comes, but right now it's not interesting. So we take the request with the query and we execute a query. We do some um, error cleanup. You don't need to do this, but this is just sort of a way how to clean up some error messages and stuff like that. And that's it, you're ready to, to return the result. So this is the entire thing. This is your um, endpoint to the world. <coughs> so we can step into one of these uh, objects just to see what they look like, for example. So I'll go into vendor. So here's my vendor. It's a normal spring component, just a service class. It could, it could also just say service here instead of component. And it exposes a couple of mutations and queries. So for example, we have a mutation. Mutations are the exact same thing as query, except that you know they have side effects. They mutate something somewhere. So apart from the name, there's no functional uh, difference. You invoke them the same way, they act the same way, everything the same, except that they cause a side effect. So GraphQL makes you aware of this by marking them uh, as a mutation. So you Creating a vendor is obviously a mutation. It causes a side effect. So here we are exposing this method. This is a regular method that you would normally have in a class like this. It takes an argument of type vendor, so a, a rich object, not just some string or int or something, but a real object. It persists this vendor, blah, blah. It, does, it creates an ID and you know mocks something, I don't know. And then finally it uh, persists it, and then it returns it back this persisted version. If you, you had some, you know, Hibernate or JPA or whatever, this would be, you would call your repository class or your entity manager, whatever, to persist. You return the entity back. So here we have <coughs> a query that asks for a vendor by ID. So as it implies, we get an ID here of type long and we search for a vendor in our storage. If we find it, we return it. If we, if not, we don't we return a 
Uh, we actually throw a runtime exception here, which is maybe not the nicest thing we do, but it's totally valid. So we throw a runtime exception, vendor not found. We have more of these, so you can search for vendors by name and things like that, just a simple query, nothing special, takes a name, returns a set of vendors or something. The point, point being that this is the same type of method, same structure, same everything like you would normally do. There's nothing GraphQL specific here except for the annotation, which as we noted is completely optional. The annotation is only the most explicit way to do things, but completely optional. I like it for explicitness to use it in the examples, but that's it. So let's run this. So, oh, I don't see my interface now. Uh, how do I get out of this mode? Okay. That, that was too much out of this mode. Oh. Does anybody know how to get out of this? Okay, I guess this works. Okay, so I'll just start it. There. Simple spring boots, nothing fancy. Now the fancy part is the logo. Oh yeah. god, but of course. <coughs> but of course. Uh, no, not that way. This way. So this uh, let me zoom this. Oh, I don't have a mouse, so zooming will be slightly interesting. Close plus. I guess I can do that. Yay. All right, that's much better. Okay, so the application that you see here is uh, called Graphical, spelled like GraphQL, just with an I. So this is Graphical. This is a sort of in-browser development environment for GraphQL. You can use it to uh, inspect your schema, fire queries, try out things. This is a, an open source thing. I mean, it's uh, 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 you can find uh, also different versions of it around the web. Some some are more interesting than others. Provide you a way to inject um, headers for security and things like that. This is the default version. So notice uh, one absolutely beautiful thing. By the virtue of knowing one single endpoint, the client can figure everything out about your services. So here, it knows all the possible queries, it knows all the possible mutations, so all the queries, all the mutations, it knows the types of everything. So for example, vendor by ID takes a long returns a vendor, where vendor is a type that has this and this, and it has a product in stock which is, has this and this and blah. So you can drill down and inspect the schema. So you can completely leave it to the client to auto discover everything that there is uh, to know about your service. And this has another nice side effect in that this environment can then offer auto complete for everything you do. So if you start typing anything, I'll just start typing somewhere like this. So I say, vendor and it also it immediately knows what i can do so i say you know vendor by name i say name it, it immediately knows the name of the parameter and so on so it basically gives you this very very nice way to work with this uh here i have multiple so if you have multiple things uh at the same time and you want to run something it will ask you which one you want to run and that's, if you remember, it's totally not important, but if you do remember, there was a parameter when you were executing, there was a query name and operation name. That's operation name. So in case uh, both of, so everything will be sent to the client, uh, to the server, both of these will be sent to the server, but only the one whose name matches will be executed. It's just, yeah, I mean, uh, just a little trick you can do if you want to keep sending always the same thing. It's not particularly interesting, but okay. Yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> Basically, let's say you have a hard-coded query with multiple things and then you just keep changing which one you want to execute or something stupid like that. I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm trying to defend it here, but I have no idea why would you implement <laughs> such a feature. <laughs> but yeah. Okay, so let's create a vendor. So we create a vendor. 
So I gave it name test2, I gave it an address. Oh yeah, because the input for create vendor was the entire vendor object, I just created the entire vendor object here. So I have, I gave the name, I have an address. Address is also an object, it has a street number, one, two, four, fake street. Uh, so I created it, so here's a vendor. I get, an, uh, oh yeah, I asked for ID back, name, address, street number. So I got a couple of things back here. And what I requested is what I got back. So an interesting point here to notice is that mutation is also a query. <coughs> so I created a vendor, but I immediately selected something back. So I didn't have to create a vendor and then get a vendor. You know, like you might do with REST. You would create something, you get a 201, create it, and then you do another get to get, get it back or something. So yeah. So that's it. So I can create another guy, maybe. I'll create a guy called, <coughs> I don't know, Hazar or something. I run another create vendor query. He gets ID two, and you know another thing. So now I can request. So I got. I can request it back. I can say get vendor by ID, and the ID I've given here is two. So I get my second guy back. Well, they live in the same address, so it's not particularly interesting in this case, but okay. So I got a vendor, but let's try, let's, you know, let's do the wrong thing. Let's ask for vendor 22, which we never created. So I'll do that. Boom. So what you get back, in, because the, the root query failed, the entire result will be null, and then you will get a very, very nice error, saying vendor not found, uh, location, it will tell you, for example, if you did syntactical error, it will tell you the exact location in your query where you made the syntac syntactical error. In this case, it wasn't that type of error, it was a runtime error, so there's no location. Uh, it will give you a type, so it's a data fetching exception, meaning it, ha it happened in runtime while fe fetching stuff. So you can maybe you know show it differently to the client or do whatever. You are, of course, in charge of how you filter error messages, <coughs> what you do. This is just a simple behavior that I implemented that it just returns the error message of the exception. Is there, uh, is there also a way to say, hey, I'm okay with the street and number maybe not being there? Uh, Can you just give me the rest that you did get? Yes, so that's the thing. Here, uh, the reason why I'm getting null here is because the root thing failed. So just the root thing didn't exist, vendor. But let's say there was a problem while fetching, uh, if, I, if I went yeah, and had a query like maybe like this, <coughs> that I also had a name and address, so let's say like this, and then only this, this part failed, then you would get everything else, the failed part would be null, and you would still get error for what failed, but everything else you would get back. So partial results are a completely normal thing. You, you could, I mean technically on your server, you could check if there's an error, and if there is, just return nothing always, but that would be kind of weird. So uh, by default, you will always get a partial result back. And the extension? Can I yes, of course, please do. What's the extensions? In the ah, yes. Uh, extensions is, uh, it's not defined by the spec. It's just something that sort of the community decided is a good idea to have. I think at least it wasn't in the spec now. It might be. Uh, it will contain whatever the server wants to add. So one common thing that you want to add there. <laughs> yes, but one, the, the only real yeah, a Kraken, for example. <laughs> so uh, the the common thing that you might want to add, and the only thing that actually anybody uses it for right now, the only implementation ever, is to add uh, like a uh, sort of runtime performance statistics. So it can uh, what it does, uh, it's implemented for, at least I know Scala, Java, and JavaScript have implementations for this. Uh, Apollo people were the first one to, Apollo is the company that does uh, um, the client, uh, JavaScript client for GraphQL. They're the first one that implemented this, and it gives you a very nice breakdown. So it gives you the same structure as the result, but instead of the values, it tells you how much time it took to, to fetch that specific piece and how many times it was invoked. So if you have a list of you know, 10 people called John and you get a Twitter profile for each, it will say uh, average uh, or you know maximum or whatever loading time for a Twitter profile was half a second and it was invoked 10 times uh, uh, to render this result. So you can get these like uh, statistics for the performance. This is the only thing that anybody uses it for. 
there's so there's a, we have an implementation in GraphQL Java, and we took it from Sangria, which is the Scala implementation, and they took it from uh, Apollo Optics from JavaScript. It's actually really really nice for debugging. You turn it on, it tells you everything, and then you can uh, 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 use it to even. Oh yeah, I'll talk about it a little later. But it has a very cool advanced use case. Sure. You don't. So, uh, well, you do, but it's not fine grained. So, uh, what the specification says is that you return 200 for everything except when there's something wrong with the runtime itself. So, if something is wrong with a GraphQL server itself, like it can't even, you know, construct the scheme or execute or do anything, then it will return uh, an error. In all other cases, if it reached the server and you know started executing the query. Uh, for even if validation fails, even if your uh, fetching fails, it will return a 200 and the describe errors. Yeah, just for example, if uh, there's a user, a bank user with a yep. balance, yeah, yep. and he wants to query his balance, yep. if let's say the balance comes out as null, yep. and if I show null to the user, it's going to be a bad thing, right? It's going to be incredible. Yeah, 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 of course. But you will have a, an error. It will, you know, have a type, and you will know it's an error, and you okay, will describe so it and everything. The types, uh, it's good to put it out. Okay. Yes. So this is by the spec, but it doesn't say you have to do it that way. You can absolutely ignore that because the whole part yeah. with HTTP is your in your hands. You saw what I did. It's I took her. Yeah. Yes. Sure. Yes. Okay. So the runtime doesn't care. Runtime doesn't even know it's in a web server. It could be, you know, a desktop application or something. It doesn't care. So. The sort of the suggestion is to do it this way, but feel free to ignore if it makes sense in your case to ignore that. Thank you. Yep. For the sure. extensions uh, and the error part, yep. I think in the graphical, what we are using at least, we don't get errors if there is no error. Is it a new thing that it always shows the extension on error? Or uh, error um, well, yes and no. So the thing is, um, what I did here, I just returned the entire execution result. So that was kind of my choice. Because I know graphical expects that, <coughs> but it's not necessary. Uh, there is a method specifically now. I'm talking GraphQL Java. Specifically, there's a method on the execution result that says to spec, which will return the specification abiding object, uh, which will not have these um, if they're empty. It will basically be according to the spec. So it's completely something that I've done, not necessarily like that. Yeah. You don't have to always show extensions or always show errors or whatnot. It just that yeah, it was the shortest thing for me to do so, and the the to spec method was only added in version four, and I'm still in version three, so that's also great. Yep. Response is always JSON. Not necessarily. Nobody implemented anything else, but there's nothing in the spec to say it has to be JSON. So the spec just says you need to return this uh, this structure with these values, but you can encode it in anything you want. So transport is not a matter of the specification. It doesn't care. So you could uh, do like proto buffs or something. It doesn't care. It's just that nobody implemented it yet. But uh, the specification only basically cares what happens inside the engine. And then outside, like the transports, how you receive your queries and how you send your results back, that's, that's on you. It's just that currently the entire world is you know, in a JSON craze, so that's it. I was actually thinking of maybe how, how cool it would be to implement the Erlang uh, type syntax if you were by any chance familiar with it because it looks like a JSON but it's better because you can directly use it in Erlang without the serialization and that was cool and <laughs> I was looking in Elixir for that and that's why it was cool. So, so it's totally doable, it's just that no one has it. So there will be a short demo, you can find this on GitHub of course and then you know do un uh, uh, unspeakable things to it. Um, no, let me see how I get this back. Boop. Great success. Oh my god, it's so huge. Mm. <coughs> okay, we don't want this anymore here either. Let's get that back. <coughs> All right, so we are back in the. I found a question about the uh, sure. so you, 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 you can do anything yep. uh, error wise, but I think many tools like the GraphQL uh, yep. is expecting uh, always 200 and then errors and because yes. the tooling and all the implementation. True. Have because of, yeah, because of uh, 
That's true. So in, this is sort of the norm and the expected thing. So the tooling will kind of expect it. Um, so it will be easier if you respect uh, that for yourself. But you know, I'm sure with uh, enough customization, you can get around most of the things if you really want to. Because all of these tools are, you know, customizable to the level where you can do things. But yeah, you'll you'll do yourself a favor if you take the advice. Then everything will work out of the box. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. So that was what's GraphQL and how to do it in Java and how awesome my library is and how awesome I am for writing it. Uh, obviously. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> Um, but now the meaty, the, 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 the meaty part. So the problems with this stuff, because there are. First problem, malicious queries. As we said, client is in charge of what gets fetched, like really in charge. They choose everything. What if the client is evil? They could request some, uh, an object hierarchy that is so big that it basically fetches the universe. Meaning it will probably destroy your server and do terrible things and you know what, or may, you know create a loop that will cost uh, whatever and then block all other clients or something like that. Basically exhaust your resources. So that will be one problem. What you can do so for the manifestation of this is the uh, arbitrarily complex query. So client can request arbitrarily complex results back, including really complex. Arbitrary size of results could be huge, fetching the universe. What we can do about it, there's a couple of things you can do about it. You can analyze the complexity of the AST, AST meaning the abstract syntax tree, meaning what you get when you parse the query. And this is the approach that's taken by vast majority of users, I would say. And there are implementations to make this really easy for most, if not all, the implementations of, Gra of GraphQL. So there is one in GraphQL Java itself, but it's pretty simplistic. It can't do too many things. There's one in speaker, which is not so simplistic and can do much more. <laughs> um, you can also limit depth, which is uh, sort of the, on the same uh, train of thought like the previous one, but simpler. So you just limit the depth. This is what uh, GitHub, for example, is doing. GitHub just says you can get up to, I don't know, 10 levels deep uh, results. And if you go deeper than that, we just stop and we just give you 10 levels and then you're done. So as long as it's a rel relatively flat structure that you want, it's fine. So this is one way, for example, to protect yourself. You can also limit execution time. So depending on your execution strategy, there's a bunch provided by GraphQL Java out of the box. Um, simple strategy being that everything is executed serially. So you execute the first thing, then, you know, depth first, everything the next, you know, uh, so, but it's not necessary. There's also uh, an execution strategy that works by uh, having an execution service, so it means a bunch of threads. So it will distribute uh, the chunks of the query on the same level to different uh, executors, to, well, different threads of execution, where, which then gives you an option on the execution service itself to limit the time. So you say if the task takes more than two seconds, kill the task. So for example, you can do something like that and just say all queries taking more than two seconds are deemed evil and we interrupt them and return an error. And the most drastic and simplest, but least useful, I guess, is to, but actually very viable so solution is to simply whitelist all the queries. You can do this only if the, both the client and the server are in your control. So if you're the client and you know all the possible queries, and uh, there's even tools that will uh, analyze, um, but this is for JavaScript. I'm not sure you can pull the same thing out for Java, but maybe. Um, that will analyze your code to figure out all the possible queries. Uh, actually, if you're using Relay, I think, and uh, some of these uh, clients, you can totally do that. Doesn't matter what the, what the server is. So it can actually analyze your front end code, figure out all the queries dynamically, and generate a list of the queries. Uh, all possible queries for your application and it will give uh, a unique ID to each query and then on the server you don't even need to actually receive the query then the client just sends the ID so I'd, I'd like query 70B and then it returns it back and then only the whitelist of queries are good and all the other ones are bad and done super simple it's so you can do that sorry, it's, it's not true that your query is always arbitrarily complex right like you can only 
uh, if, if uh, on the server side you define your model as well, I'm only I'm going to give you this field, yep. or, or not. Then uh, oh sure sure, but if you uh, you remember the first example where a character had friends yeah, where exactly. characters so it can go forever. Right. So sure, if your model is in a way that it naturally prevents arbitrary arbitrary complexity, then sure. But you might not be in a situation where you can do that. If, you know. Yeah, but th that would be the easiest way to. Uh, well, yes. The problem, but well, the easiest problem. depends. Like it makes you change your model, which is maybe a very expensive thing to do, actually. So depends on context, but sure, it's a thing you can do. So these are some of the things you can do. Uh, so out of the box, you actually have all of these out of the box. Well, at least there's a tool for all of these, so you don't have to implement anything. So GraphQL Java will provide the first two. Um, you kind of have a little bit of plumbing to do for the third one, but it's still provided thing. And for whitelisting, it's a client side thing, so you have to do some configuration for your tool chain and whatever, but it's doable uh, with existing tooling. Then, um, then nothing happens when I press this. Right, so the next problem, this is maybe the most interesting problem actually. So, M plus one. Very, very, very easy to run into this uh, if you don't do, if you just do what I've described so far, you're guaranteed to run into M plus one. Actually, we've already seen M plus one. So here's a, this is something that we've already seen. So you request people by name, you get all the Johns, and then you want the profiles for all the Johns. If you remember, Twitter profile resolver was talking to the Twitter API to fetch it. So you fetch people by name, and you get 100 people back. And then for each of those, you have to get a profile, which means you talk to the Twitter API a hundred times. There's your M plus one problem. And of course, that's much worse than what you would have, for example, with a RESTful architecture or something. Normally, you don't have this problem with REST. Well, maybe you do, but it's not as obvious as here, and it's not as easy to run into it. Because you would know for, from the parameters or something, you would have custom logic to assemble the result, and you could already batch on that level. Here, you don't get that. Um, chance because uh, GraphQL uh, engine is the one assembling the results. So here's our uh, implementation again. So we had the person service, Twitter profile, talking to Twitter API to get it. So it means for 100 users named John, it will call Twitter API 100 times. We don't want that. That's the error. So one simple, super simple way is to solve it like this. You annotate it with this batched annotation. And then, if you look at it right now, it takes a person, it returns a profile. If it's batched, it takes a list of people and it returns a list of profiles. That's it. So you take the method, you just annotate it like this. Of course, it means that this can batch. If this cannot batch, then, well, it doesn't work, nothing happens. But you cannot optimize that in any case then. So as long as the Twitter API can batch uh, uh, multiple requests you can get uh, for multiple people, you can return multiple things, it's enough to just do this. And then uh, it will internally be smart enough to uh, collect everything on one level instead of one by one and then uh, uh, do a batch call. So in your logic, uh, in your service layer, this is what you would do. You would basically, instead of getting one thing and returning one thing, you re take a list, return a list, and annotate with batch so it knows that uh, the client doesn't need to provide a list of persons, but that it will naturally be collected o over the whole level of, uh, of query. That's, that's what it, that means. Uh, will it try to deduplicate the... Uh, with this strategy, it will not. There is a strategy that will help. This is like the super simple batching, so it doesn't take care of the magic, but there is a way to do that. So. so Example, maybe yep. it's quite stupid as me, but it doesn't matter for the moment. If I, I use the bus annotation, yep. let's say I forget to put a list yep. in both the method argument and the return type. Yep. Will I have a runtime? Uh, you will get an exception, I, I'm pretty sure, even when you're trying to build a schema. It will tell you that you claim this is batched but isn't and it can't, uh, it can't map it then. Because when it's trying to map it, it will expect always list in, list out. And yeah, it won't so happen. So even, even in IntelliJ, by the time I am about to type bots, 
Sadly, will not because we need. The I didn't really write the IntelliJ plugin to do this, but uh, <laughs> so it will not. But the time you try to build the schema, it will explode. Okay, cool. So it won't help you immediately, which would be amazing if somebody, you know, somebody would <laughs> write it. Then that would totally be possible. If you do something like paging. Yes, uh, that's a. Uh, oh, did I have a slide about paging? Not yet. Oh, I don't think I have a slide about paging. We'll talk about paging. Actually, let's talk about page. Um, uh, there is, so, uh, two things. First, you kind of have everything you need in the sense that um, your, uh, your queries are already allowed to take arbitrary argu arguments. So arguments could be, you know, page number and size, and that's it. You return a list, and that's paging, done. But there's also a more um, uh, interesting thing to note. Relay, which is uh, Facebook's client for GraphQL, so front-end thing, um, has its own spec, so it has its own specification. Uh, what it expects from the GraphQL schema on the server to satisfy, so that it can do some magic on its own. And one of the things that it de uh, defines is uh, paging, how, it, how, how to do paging. And it defines this cursor-based pagination. Um, which is, it doesn't really fit SQL storages, because, well, maybe it does, but depending on whether you have cursors and whether you use them or whatever. So it, it's not a simple limit offset uh, pagination, but a cursor-based one. Uh, so if you want to, you can adopt this model even if you're not using Relay, obviously. You can adopt this because it's pretty famous. Let's say uh, uh, nobody will be surprised when it sees this uh, implemented. And it defines this object called connection which uh, is a paginated result. And then it's, um, a connection has a list of nodes, meaning actual results, where each node has the, the, the result and the cursor. And then based on that, you can say, give me 10 after this cursor, or give me five before this cursor, and so on. And what uh, the reason why Relay mandates it this way is that it can be really smart. So for example, if, you're, if your pages are overlapping or anything like that, it knows not to refetch uh, the things that it already has, for example. That's why it has a cursor for everything. So, for example, if you're asking, I don't know, you know, uh, a page of 10 and then another page starting from here, it will only fetch the delta automatically and things like that. So this is why this specification came to be. So if you're using Relay, you kind of have to use this. If you're not using Relay, it's optional. So you can implement very simple offset limit uh, paging by yourself. You just return a list, you take page offset and limit and you're done. Or you can adopt this model. Uh, there is support for the relay style pagination, both in GraphQL Java itself and in speaker. Uh, for speaker, you would, instead of the list, you would return a page object. So a page of Twitter profiles, for example. And then there's some factory methods to help you make pages uh, and whatever and how to do everything else. So there is support around that as well. So basically every optional thing that Relay specification uh, defines that's, on, that's not a part of the GraphQL specification is supported by GraphQL Java and speaker out of the box. So there's three things that it defines, pagination being one and two more things for like s around mutations and something. It has some specific uh, requirements. All of those can be with just some configuration values implemented and it works. So uh, another much more interesting way of solving n plus one. So you saw the simple batching, where you take a list, you return a list, blah, done. There's, but as uh, uh, it was mentioned, it doesn't solve, for example, the problem of dupl uh, duplication, so it will batch, but if you request five times the same thing, it will still try to, you know, do that. And, um, and also it can only batch on one level. There it can't really be smart. So there's another thing. There's this thing called Data Loader, which was originally created uh, also by Facebook and then ported to various languages. Uh, <coughs> so we have a Java implementation as well. How it works is it's it's more involved than the previous one. So previous one was super simple, but also kind of limited in what it can do. This one is much more complicated, but it also can do much more interesting things. So we start by uh, creating a batch loader function uh, this could also be defined in with a lambda, but just for the case of uh, explicitness, I didn't do that in this example. I wanted to sort of make it more explicit. So you create a batch loader. 
batch loader is parameterized by two things. First being the key by which you load, and the second being the results, what you, so the thing that you load and the key by which you load it. If you think of Spring repository classes, Spring data uh, classes that are automatically generated or for JPA or anything like that, they work in the same way. You, for example, load a person, load a person by a long key, so by ID, for example, in this case. So, uh, it batch loader defines only the load function. Load function will take a list of the keys and return a promise of a list of results. When I say promise, I of course mean completable future because we live in Java, but completable future is a long and terrible word, so promise. So it gives a promise of a list of results, not the list of results itself. The simplest implementation, of course, would be something like this. You have your person service load by IDs, and it can load multiple at the same time, so you can batch load. And we delegate this to our, you know, for join uh, pool, and we uh, process this in a different thread, and we get the, the completable future as a result, so I promise. So this would be a simple way to load people by ID. So how you use this? So okay, you define this, but what then? So it's important that this is this is batch loading. So that's the important bit. Even if it's not batch loading, you will get some benefit out of this actually. But to get the most benefit, you kind of need this to be you know uh, capable of batching. Then you create an instance of a data loader. Data loader takes your batch loader as uh, created. So this thing is normally has the sco life, life scope of the application. So it lives as long as the application is there. Data loaders, mm, probably not. It's up to you how you scope them. But most common, you would just scope them to a request. So we would keep creating data loader every time. The reason why, data loader will internally, if you enable it again, it will internally maintain a cache. So if you keep requesting things with the same key, it won't try to refetch them. It will just get them from cache. And the cache lives as long as the data loader lives. So that's why you usually want to kill off data loader at the end of the request and just scope it for the request and then keep creating one so that the cache is naturally request scoped, which makes no sense. Because if you fetch anything that's user specific, for example, then you must not cache it for other people. But if you're not fetching anything that's user specific, then you can also scope the data loader on the application level or something, whatever, uh, session level maybe, I don't know. So anything, w w basically, the scope of data loader needs to correspond naturally with the scope of the cache. Or you can just disable cache and then you don't have that problem anymore. <laughs> um, but then you have other problems. So, how you use this? So you finally, you create your data loader at the beginning of the request, but what then what? So inside of your data fetcher, instead of where you would normally call person service load by ID, so not by IDs, but one, so normally, you will load a person by ID by calling your person service, saying load by ID, it would go to the database, it would fetch it, it would return. Mm -hmm. Instead of doing that, you use you say user loader load and then give ID. So you load by ID th through through the loader. So instead of loading directly, you load through this. It, it will give you back a promise and not a real thing because it will be resolved later when it's everything batched, so not right now. So you need your API basically needs to work with promises in that case. So this is what happens. So you would get a promise of a result, then inside of a different data fetcher. So in a completely different part of code, unrelated in a whole different area of the graph, you might again do a data loader load by something else. Same data loader though. So you scope it through the whole execution of the request. Doesn't matter what gets triggered, what fields get fetched. All resolver functions get triggered and in different areas, in different resolver functions, you use the same loader, you keep loading things, you get promises back, you keep loading. If the if any of these are duplicated, it immediately gives you back the cache thing if it already has it. So it deduplicates de de naturally. And then finally, super important, somewhere in your code, this is not defined where it is, and this is the tricky part, you need to dispatch all of this. So basically you accumulated all these requests. You accumulated a bunch of load requests, but you still didn't actually perform them. Once you dispatch, it will either wait for the result or not, so depending how you call dispatch, this, this one will just sort of fire it in the different thread. 
So you finally call the dispatch, it will batch load everything and then satisfy and then complete all of these promises across the board. But if it is about ready yep. bacteria, how can we ensure that by the time the dispatch is about to be executed, all the rest futures are done? Uh, th they're not done. I mean, what do you mean? That, uh, that uh, the results have been retrieved for all of them? Uh, no, uh, dispatch yes. is the one triggering this. Ah, okay. So they're not, that's the whole point. Like they're, they'll keep being unfulfilled promises until you dispatch and then it gets batch loaded. Okay. So the way this works in Node, uh, because this is a port ported from Node, the way it works in Node is super simple because you know Node has one thread. So it has a, a, a event loop and then every time it goes to the loop, it will dispatch everything. So it has a natural place to dispatch stuff not being a <coughs> retarded environment like Node, Java has multiple threads, so it doesn't have that thing that it uses, you know, that. So um, uh, you have to dispatch by yourself. This is the tricky part. And it's really hard to know where to put this dispatch request. So the way to, this is handled, how, how this is made easier in Java, GraphQL Java. Uh, GraphQL Java gives you this, uh, instrumentation API, where instrumentation is, think of it as a filter for servlets. Sort of this thing that you can attach at the beginning and the end of things and then do extra. There is already a provided instrumentation that will listen for uh, field resolutions and then when all the fields on one level, so let's say your top level query was get all people by name and then you, uh, you, you load a bunch of people, maybe a hundred, so when you're done with one level of the query, before you go into sub-queries, it will dispatch automatically at that moment. And then it, then the next level of uh, 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 nested queries gets resolved, <coughs> and everything on that level then will again be batched, and the next level will be batched, and so on and so forth. So if you use this uh, built-in uh, 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 instrumentation, it will be taken care of for you in this smart way. But you don't have to use it. You can also do something else. You can dispatch at some other time, but it's really tricky to get it right. So normally, use the instrumentation. Don't think of it too much. And I have a question. Yep. Use loader, right? It's the same, right? Sorry, the what? Uh, it, uh, it says data loader there. You mean user loader? Uh, user loader? User, yeah. yeah. Down there. Yeah. Data loader. Oh, God. Sorry. Yes, I absolutely did mean user loader. Yes. So okay. this is supposed to say user loader. Sorry. Yeah, my bad. Yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 sorry. Um, so yeah, you dispatch on the on the loader level, yeah. So that's how it's meant to work. And uh, so this is a much more advanced uh, way of handling M plus one. It's much more powerful, but it's also more tricky because it forces your logic to work with, uh, with promises. Uh, you need to worry about dispatching, although it's made uh, simpler by this uh, instrumentation mechanism. So you can do it that way. So it's fine, but still it's something to think about. Whereas the previous model was super simple. You get a list, you return a list, but if you're working with SQL, it's natural. You just do, you know, select where and it's done. You're already batching. So depending on what you're doing, if you're going to uh, batch from like SQL, you usually want the simple model then. It works great. But if you're batching from something more interesting that doesn't maybe so naturally support it, then maybe you want to do this. Like the multiple thresholds, right? Yeah. Um, For loading. Uh, there's the so even it's interesting to note even if this wasn't capable of actually batching so if this was resolving it by just going one by one and fetching so for each ID call person service load by ID one and then for each do that you would still get some benefit of doing it this way because it would at least be deduplicated if you keep using the same key it will at least not or, or multi -travel. Uh potentially okay. yes yes but uh, you can still use the same thread for everything. It will still work. It will just be weird because here I'm dispatching two different, but you don't really even need to do that. Mm -hmm. You could here just, you know, immediately give a completed promise in this thread and nothing. So it's also possible. But um, so you get some value of adopting this model. Even if you can't truly batch, you still get something. At least do deduplicate it. And if you want or can or already work with promises, this is sort of a natural uh, this maps naturally, so it's a natural solution and it works in that case very, very well. <coughs> okay, so next problem. I know I'm dumping a metric crap ton of information on you, but that's what you subscribe for when you come to a meetup that's longer, like three hours. So, um, so you, it's on you. 
Um, right, so optimizing fetching, we're over that. Um, so let's say, again, we see the same thing. We want people by name, name John, we want first and last name. Here, how we would in reality do it. This is our implementation. Get people by name, name, list of people. You would say, select star from users where name equals John. And then you get a list of people, you map it somehow, and this is what happens. So this part already comes from here, so that's easy. But what is not so nice is, well, this. You have to, you don't know what you, you don't know that the user wanted first and last name. So you have to fetch star because you don't know what will be necessary uh, on the next level of execution. So on this level, all you know is that you need to fetch persons. And then only the next level will know that it needs to resolve this field and this field. So by the time you're here, it's too early. You don't know this. And then you have to fetch star and that's it. You can't do anything about it. Well, at least, you know, not obviously. So this is what we want to optimize. We want to not have to do this. So there is a little trick. It does not actually work reliably yet. I promise to fix it in the very next version. But I'm talking speaker now. Of course, you can step around it and do it. Uh, if you're doing uh, just bare bones GraphQL Java, then there is a way to do it, obviously. Um, this is, it works like this. So you can actually, uh, there's this magical annotation that injects something from the environment, in this case, list of the, th this is the simplest way, there's m many more complicated structures that you can inject, but the simplest form would be to inject a list of strings, which then will be the list of subfields. So it will give you actually the subfield names, but on one level. If you want even deeper, example, if this wasn't the first name and last name, but it was address, and then address has street and blah. So if you want more levels, it's still possible to do it, but this is the simplest, so it will just give you the list, the, the, the immediate sub, sub, the immediate list of subfield names. Or, yeah, or a list of immediate subfields. Yeah. So uh, this, it will contain these two. So the, this list will contain these two. And then you can optimize. So you can say you only select this and only select this, and then maybe create, you know, like a, how do you say, dehydrated or whatever version of the person object that will only contain the stuff you're actually going to need. So let's say somewhere inside person, you might need to do join and then fetch addresses, and, uh, but you don't need to do any of this when the user is not going to request addresses. So don't do any joins, don't do eager fetching, don't do any of that, just, you know, just do a simple thing. Uh, eager fetch, only what you need, that's it, forget about it. Forget about it. So, uh, the last problem that I'm actually going to drill into, the last, the, the fr from now on, I'm just going to hand wave stuff. Oh yeah, go. One more question about the previous slide. Yeah. So this means that every field in, in your models is optional? Uh, it is, uh, it is not. Uh, it de depends on you when you're defining the schema, what's optional, what's not. So uh, there is a special type called non-null, and then you wrap anything in non-null to make sure that it's not optional. So even inputs can be non-null, and pieces of the output can be non-null as well. And you can go quite deep. You can say that the list is a non-null, or, or it's a list of non-nulls, but the list is nullable, and things like that. So you can be quite specific in your uh, constraints. Um, I didn't go into that because, yeah, you'll figure it out eventually when you need to, but yeah. Um, so, but this acted as if it was all uh, nullable and optional. But uh, this way you get a, yeah, like a, a type coupling with your, with your complement. Uh, that is true. You kind of, you know, might not want to do this. Maybe you want to keep it nice and clean that your service always returns people and then it doesn't care of context or whatever. So, you know, this, it, it's not something you would always do, but it's something you would do where you want to optimize, where it's important and or you want to save, you're not going to do this all the time. I mean, at least you shouldn't. Um, right, so uh, authorization. There's a couple ways to do authorization. So now we're talking about uh, whether the user is allowed to fetch some field value based on security permissions, maybe their role or, you know, whatever. So simplest way that you can do in all GraphQL anywhere doesn't matter language, context, library, whatever, is simple, simply to inject the security context 
into their resolver, meaning give all the security context necessary for the resolver function itself to make the decision. Meaning, in the concrete example, this is how you normally execute. You say graphql.execute and you give it a query. You can also give it any, any context, so anything you want. In my specific case, here, I will give the currently logged in user as the context. So this is an arbitrary object. And then, when you, in your resolver function, you can inject this contextual object via this, uh, via this uh, 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 annotation. This is in speaker terms. In GraphQL Java terms, you just, you know, uh, from your uh, uh, um, data fetching environment, you get the current context, so similar way. This is just a way how to immediately map it to, uh, to an argument, to the method. So that's where speaker comes in, this automatic mapping. So basically, you can provide any arbit completely arbitrary context to the query execution, and then you can get a hold of that uh, context. And then what you can do, you can use it to make a decision. So here it says, you know, um, it's called current. Sorry, I don't know what's with me. It should be called user, obviously. So if user, I don't know, has ID one, then I don't know, return error, whatever. Or if user get role is not admin or something, you can do something. But the problem with this approach is that it's mixing the security constraints into this business logic that doesn't really need it. Plus you would need to, you know, duplicate these codes maybe in many places on all the methods that need to do it and blah. So it's not the nicest way, but it always works for sure. Different ways, oh yeah, so putting this in the context of a web application, so how we did it in the web. So I'll go back one step. So I just showed here like you're executing by giving the query and the context, but in the web application it might look like this. We have our controller method, so reacting to post requests or whatever. We get the query by, you know, from the, as a request parameter, we get a query. How we get the current user, that's up to you, of course, how you log in. If you're using, for example, Spring Security, you would do something like this, security context, uh, get authentication. And that gives you the currently logged in user, and that's it. You provide this as a context, and then you inject it, and then you make a decision. If you're not using Spring Security or something else, I don't know, you might be checking the cookie or the tokens to, you know, load the user, prof you know, user profile based on a token, or if it's a JSON web token, you just, uh, well, read it and then get the entire context from there. So whatever the context is in your application. Other way to do this is some AOP style magic. So if you're using Spring Security, this is what is the first thing that you think of when you say security. You have your normal pre-authorize uh, annotations, as always, on the method that's exposed over GraphQL and that's it, you don't need to do anything extra because um, all your, your nor uh, speaker will invoke your normal service methods the normal way Spring invokes them. So all normal, nothing strange there. Um, so just by adding these annotations like normal in Spring, it will, it will still work, it will still be respected and it will work uh, as usual. So that would work as long of, co as long of course as, l as your this doesn't run in a different thread or something, but that's normal Spring stuff. It has nothing to do with GraphQL anymore. Uh, then further topics that I'm not gonna discuss in detail, just mention that they exist as a thing and that you maybe want to think about them. Uh, I talked about security only in the context of whether you're allowed to fetch the field value, but that might not be enough. In many contexts, you don't want the user to even know the field exists in the first place, maybe. So you want the schema to be dynamically filtered, sort, sort of. So you want the user to see the schema in a restricted way, maybe. Uh, the way you could do this, uh, as of GraphQL Java 4, this is built-in capability. So you just provide, when you're constructing the schema, you provide an object that's able to, uh, at runtime, make decisions of what's visible and whatnot. So this is something that's completely supported now in GraphQL Java 4, uh, and uh, this is what GitHub, for example, is doing. They're also restricting dynamically, based on user privilege, what you get to see. So you only see your own projects and not everybody's project and things like that. Um, schema extension is another in interesting topic. For example, maybe you want different users 
to uh, dynamically uh, be able to load certain extensions. So let's say your system supports something like plugins, and then plugin can extend the basic schema by adding more fields and more queries to it. So this is also something, this is somewhat supported, but not really right now. Um, schema creation is generally cheap operation. Once the first schema has been created, you can uh, reuse the uh, objects from the types and everything from the first schema when creating new ones. So it can maybe cheaply <coughs> be done that you create a new schema based on the old one plus stuff. So it could be done in a relatively cheap way, it's possible. Uh, there is a little bit of support for that similar situation in speaker as well, where you take an existing schema, it takes all the types from there, and then you keep defining more types, something like that. Uh, caching is a super interesting topic because now everything is very granular. Every field has its own resolution logic, which means you can't do like you do for REST. You take the URL and then you cache everything. So whatever, uh, you, you cache the entire thing. You can't do that anymore because now client chooses what they fetch and it's very granular. So your caching is either very granular or it doesn't work. So on one hand, it's much more complicated. On another, it's much more powerful. So it's here and there. Um, yeah, so you have a much more granular caching. You can, you know, uh, just because a, a, a whole big graph is requested, but only certain pieces of the graph, for example, are cached already, you can do it like that. So it's much more complicated to manage, but more, more powerful. And then, you know, uh, it's still new technology, so you might come up with uh, more uh, interesting edge cases that no, have, no one has thought of, so that's also possible. If that happens, you can find me here. This is me. Uh, well, that, this is me. Uh, you can find speaker and other and example and everything else by going here, which will just redirect you here. So, you know, that's the same thing. This is me on Twitter, so you can follow me if you want uh, Java, GraphQL, goodness and stuff. And um, in case you forgot to ask me something, this is your turn. Uh, I would suggest <laughs> that we do the Q&A part, part during the drinks because we are already... That like totally running works. Running late well, we kind of did we're QA. Gonna, we're going to shoot. We're gonna yeah, sure, shoot. sure. That's okay. So that's it. Uh, I'll upload the presentation to the meetup so you'll find the link for that. And the rest of it you find here. And... Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Yeah, uh, you're most welcome. Quite a extensive and helpful and super wow one. Uh, I asked you if you want a short one. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you want a big. You said you want the biggest one. So I, I got the big <laughs> one, but the thing is that it's a uh, premium package. It's <laughs> <laughs> we already got late. Uh, sure, sure, I understand. I, I mean, we we got late to start. So yeah, uh, let's have our drinks now. And uh, our speaker is gonna decide after this session what was the, be <laughs> the best question, uh, and the I best question wins. Like the best question wins uh, the JetBrains license. So let's go for the drinks, guys. Thank you a lot. <laughs>